Our last speaker is um, Dr. Jeffrey Marks. He's Associate Professor of Surgery at uh, Case Medical Univ uh, Center, Director of Surgical Endoscopy at University of Hospitals in Cleveland. He will be speaking on the fundamentals of endoscopic surgery, the next evolution in endoscopic skills training. And I talk fast, so we'll be okay. So, um, and I want to thank Mike and Dan for putting this together and glad that you guys are sitting through this and hopefully not falling asleep from the lunch that we were given. Um, so, the title of this talk, The Next Evolution in Endoscopic Skills Training. Well, uh, to be honest with you, I'm really not sure that it's actually training, but it's really testing, all right, because one little component of a five to seven year residency really can't be their whole training. And I think we have to remember that, that all these different things that we're looking at are assessment tools as well as training tools. And Leanne went through some stuff how you can use an assessment tool as a training tool as well. And I think the creativity that will develop out of these kinds of things will come from people like you out there uh, and let us know exactly how you're using these tools. Um, this is my disclosure slide. Uh, none of these will impact my talk today. Um, so objectives of my talk, basically, why do we need an evolution? What is so important about evolution of endoscopic training? Why do we have to do this? What exactly is FES? What is FES not? I mean, what exactly does it not represent? And what are some of the expectations we have for FES down the road? So basically, I, I think for those of you that are program directors or that work with residents, you understand there's definitely a dilemma that we have created. So we've kind of created our own monster, at least some of the people like myself, who have been pushing flexible endoscopy. And the increased endoscopy numbers for residents has created a problem in the sense that even getting 85 uh, endoscopies, you know, 50 colons, 35 in upper endoscopies, has become a big, big problem, not only for the surgical side, but for our friends, the gastroenterologists, who are ending up training many of our surgical residents. Decreased resident work hours, again, whether they're spending 20 hours in the cafeteria, I'm not so sure, but obviously we have a minimum amount of time period that people have to get their training in, and I think it's very important that we maximize the time that they are spent at the hospital. There's obviously a mandate for all of us to have sim centers, okay? That isn't something new, it's come around and it will be mandatory by this year. Um, but the other thing is also, as someone, and I step on my soapbox frequently when I talk about surgical endoscopy, there are so many things that we don't do anymore surgically that are being replaced by endoscopic procedures that are continuing down the road. I mean, things like common bile duct expiration, colonoscopic polypectomy, all these things that used to be surgical procedures are now managed endoscopically, and I think we need to make sure that we keep that in our realm as surgeons because I think we're going to be left with central lines, which now I guess IR people do, in trauma care. So... Getting back to FES, because I think that's what I was supposed to talk about here a little bit more, is, is what is this? Well, you heard the talk about FLS, and basically we are uh, the stepbrother or stepsister of, of this wonderful uh, project that took seven years to put together, all right? FLS didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of time, a lot of time for the validation, and uh, we'll talk about our timeline a little bit, but as you heard, it is mandated by the American Board of Surgery, by the Defense Department, and as well as the governments in both New Zealand and Australia, again, who have adopted FLS as a standard for their resident training. So FES represents an off-the-shelf program. That is that we basically will have a component that will be utilized for didactics and uh, for hands-on. And I think the most important thing to understand about all of these things is the goal of this is establishing a baseline not for hospital credentialing, and we'll talk about what FES doesn't represent, but a minimal level of proficiency in endoscopy, all right? And what does that mean? Well, basically, it means what is it gonna be to be minimally proficient, okay, in endoscopic cognitive skills, as well as technical skills. And this basically represents someone at about a PGY2 or PGY3 level that has completed your endoscopic rotation, whether it be a four-week rotation, a six-week rotation, but someone that has finished their junior, so to speak, endoscopic training, or a GI fellow, okay, that has finished their first year. Remembering that a GI fellow after one year, after their three years of medical residency is, is like a PGY-4. So it's comparable year standard uh, with a dedicated GI endoscopic exposure. So this also contains four components similar to FLS. They have a web-based, we started out web-based, we were lucky. We've learned a lot from not so much the mistakes, but the hardships that FLS had to go through. But there's a didactic component, basically taking a bunch of chapters that people have written and putting them in a web-based interactive uh, uh, high fidelity type of uh, situation. There's a high stakes written exam, and we'll talk about what this represents, a validated test. So just to let you all know, there is not a single test that you guys take 
okay, in your lifetime, for those of you there in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever it is that has ever been validated other than FLS. A driving test, okay, not validated. The American Board of Surgery, okay, your test is not validated. It's, it's good, it's what we have, but I think we're at a high level here of trying to show that we can come up with something better. The hands-on tool also we are validating, as well as an assessment of actual technical skills and clinical skills um, similar to FLS. So what is the web-based program? Well, we put together seven uh, different chapters that are now become 12 different components on the uh, uh, web-based module. And these were written by independent authors, reviewed by multiple surgeons, reviewed by gastroenterologists, basically uh, to put together what we thought were the most important components. And this has all been done basically with the help of a high stakes uh, validated test writing company. So this company called Criterion, who's based out in Colorado, has done multiple validated testings, not for medical people, but for a lot of non-medical situations and we utilize their obviously uh, expertise to do this and basically what we initially did is we took a bunch of gastroenterologists, a bunch of surgeons and we weighted different topics in endoscopy, all right, heat energy sources, endoscopic clips, GI perforation, you know, and looked at all these different components and that basic weighting allowed us to determine how many questions we had to write. And we wrote 250 questions. For those of you that ever written for Absite or any other type of thing, this was a very, very painstaking, difficult, you know, somewhat arduous task, but we had to obviously put together a, at least a pool of questions because some of them weren't going to be very good, all right? And that's when we learned from our validation. We'll talk about that. So these are now undergoing validation right now as we speak. And I'll implore all of you to understand that here at the meeting this today, tomorrow, and Saturday, you can do beta testing on the written exam. And there are two advantages of that. One, you'll be able to help us obviously validate this tool. And secondly, by taking this exam, you will receive your voucher, all right? So when this comes out, and our goal is that this also will be mandated by the American Board of Surgery someday, probably about 2011, 2012, for your residents, that you will save the economics of having to buy vouchers, you will have your voucher. Now, you'll have to take the test over again, and there is no passing grade. So it's not as if anyone will know your score. We want you, obviously, to do the best you can. But again, that final beta testing is in process. We we need, for any of you here that have residents and fellows, we need more junior level people, but upper level people as well. We're at about 230 people enrolled. We have to get up to 360 to actually have validation. So let's talk about the hands-on tool. Again, similar to FLS, it's a didactic as well as a hands-on skill assessment. So we basically went ahead and deconstructed the components of endoscopy, not just colonoscopy, but upper endoscopy. And this is GI endoscopy. This does not include bronchoscopy or rigid endoscopy. And the testing that we decided, we spent a lot of time deciding which should be on a VR system, a non-VR system. And we basically settled on VR for several reasons. One, objectively, we'd be able to have better metrics to measure, as opposed to nothing against FLS, but cutting out the pieces of paper and trying to measure and accurately determine how much was missed is a painstaking assessment or proctoring component. And if we didn't have to go through that in terms of having you know, lots of proctors, we thought we would benefit ourselves. The other thing is to understand is that the testing, yes, has to be done on the tool that we are validating, but training can be done on anything. You can use any out-of-the-box type training tool. You can use high fidelity, low fidelity. You can use other simulators. But those are the kind of things to understand, though, that the validation will be on the, the simulation, uh, the Symbionics GM Mentor 2 that we are uh, doing right now. And the final beta testing is undergoing right now. So when we looked at the different components or the deconstruction of endoscopy, we came up with five separate tasks that we thought were important. One is navigation, which include obviously tip deflection and torquing of the endoscope, whether it be upper or lower endoscopy. Loop reduction, obviously more for a lower endoscopic procedure. Retroflexion, as well as traversing a sphincter or traversing across the pylorus. Mucosal evaluation, and then targeting for such things as biopsying or treating uh, bleeding. So, well, go ahead. This is one of the first prototypes of the navigation system. And again, you'll be able to see all these in the Learning Center, okay, here this week, um, as well as at the FLS FES booth by the registration. So this task, you can see there's a shadow, okay, uh, the white shadow uh, right here. And the goal basically is to take this kind of chest piece or cone and get it inside the inner shadow here. And this requires obviously tip deflection and then the cone goes away. And there is obviously a certain number of cones that you have to traverse through to go ahead and pass this test. The testing, obviously, assessment or the metrics are based on 
components of error, as well as complications such as touching the wall or missing the cones and things like that, as well as time. Now, time in and of itself is not a great metric when it comes to measuring endoscopy, especially when it comes to now where we're being pushed to take more time upon, let's say, sequel withdrawal and stuff like that. And so I, I think we're trying to get away from just simple things such as time as being our factors for measurement. So the next one is mucosal evaluation. Again, this is where time has not been a great metric for us. But we look at basically different targets. So this starts with the endoscope all the way at the cecum, okay? So that there's not a cecal insertion. And you can see the different targets right here. And by keeping the target within your uh, endoscopic view, the targets will melt away. And there's a number of targets that have to be identified in and behind folds. And this requires, obviously, the use of endoscopy as well as insufflation to go ahead and manipulate the endoscope, identify these, uh, uh, so to speak, polyps or, or mucosal abnormalities and then obviously sample them with an optical biopsy. So things that we also have to remember is no matter how we look and putting ourselves together with a cognitive as well as a skills thing, we have to know how does this apply clinically? You know, what is the assessment we can find clinically? And so this was put together, this is called gauges, and this is based on goals, and Leanne really didn't go into that much, but that was probably one of the biggest things that the uh, McGill group and the MIST group was able to do is come up with a global assessment. And so this is our global assessment of GI endoscopic skills, and this has been validated, okay, in the sense that how you score on on a, goal, on a gauges test correlates with your clinical skills. Now it's a very simple, it's basically a five point Likert scale for five different components of an endoscopy and this is one for both upper and lower endoscopy and it's a single grading system with a single observer and again is it as good as sequel withdrawal time, sequel intubation rates, adenoma polyp detection rates, we really don't know, but basically we do know that this is actually validated uh, as it uh, compares to actual endoscopic skills, and that's what we're going on right now. There is no other skill assessment tool out there, so no matter what your gastroenterologists tell you in terms of how many number of cases you need, there is nothing out there that is validated for assessment of our skills. So let's kind of jump away what FES is not, and this is pretty important to understand. FES is not going to be meant to be a credentialing or hospital privileging tool, all right? We do not expect this, at least I, I don't expect, at least right now as I stand up here, that hospitals will require attending physicians to pass this test. I think it would be a great thing. FLS now has been utilized in certain cities. Dan Jones in Boston has been able to use FLS for insurance, okay, credit uh, accreditation, so to speak, such that people that are FLS certified have maybe better insurance rates. Well, that's fine, okay? But again, we need to get away, away from this word credentialing. You will get a certificate, and again, even certification sometimes puts a little chill up my back because that's really not what we're doing. And the other thing is FBS is not meant to replace clinical experience basically, nor cognitive endoscopic or GI disease training, all right? You still need to go through residency. Now, what I will tell you is other things, other people other than surgeons and GI people may look to FBS for this. Family practice, okay? Internal medicine, maybe nurse practitioners, all right? May come to look at FES as a way for people to be able to do flexible endoscopy, okay, uh, under their kind of tutelage. And again, I don't want to get into that because I'm not one that privileges a family practice person. So basically, in, in conclusion, FBS will, will be, and not hopefully, but will be the only and first validated tool for assessment of technical skills and knowledge in flexible endoscopy. We are expected for distribution later this fall. Our rollout will be, and I'm going to talk to you about what else is going to be here at this meeting, but this has already been introduced to the American Board of Surgery, ASCRS, ASGE, as well as the American Program Directors in Surgery. And our expectations and our goals are that this is going to be a mandated, required component of surgical training. And probably your residents are going to have to pass this, I imagine, probably by 2012, okay, maybe 2013. So again, getting your vouchers now will definitely save you some money. The GI adoption of this is, is going to be a little, I think, more challenging. Um, I think as the GI doctors come to realize on MOC and proficiency testing, you know, I think they'll understand if there's a validated tool out there, why not have their GI fellows go through this test and obviously you know, show themselves as being minimally proficient. So basically, things that you can do. Well, go visit the FLS booth, the FES booth by the registration. We have up there the web-based didactic. You can go on and take a look at the components that are available 
available there, as well as the questions themselves, obviously not the answers. You'll also be able to visit the Learning Center, where we have both the Symbionic, uh, the Mentor uh, 2, GI Mentor 2, as well as a desktop prototype that we may hopefully someday use for training, maybe not for testing, but for training for FES. Um, I'd love to tell you, have you come out to the FES rollout. If you guys are here still Saturday and you got nothing to do, please come and we'll show you a little bit more of the validation as well as the actual modules and the different beta testing stuff. And again, if you can participate in this beta testing, I think you'll be able someday, five, 10 years from now, tell your residents, hey, I remember way back when before FES really came out. I was there, I helped, and I was one that was able to give some comments and help this become an actual reality. And I think basically you need to understand that beta testing is, is required. I've learned so much about the concept of validation over the last three or four years uh, when it comes to actually making a test. But basically they'll take walk-ins. So if you go up to the FES, FLS booth, even after we're done today, um, and the test it takes about one to one and a half hours. It's 120 questions, and obviously we would encourage your comments, and there's a whole section that will allow comments. Thank you very much.